Bishop Hazard, what are your most pleasant memories of growing up here in South County? Well, for one thing, the most pleasant one is the the neighborhood in which I grew up in. We grew up in a neighborhood with almost all Italians. Okay. We was the only black family on the street. Okay. And they treated us as if we were family. Right. Let, me, let me give you a little scenario first why I say that. Mm -hmm. My dad passed away when we were very young. And my mother raised nine of us. Okay. And these neighbors would be right there for us for anything we needed. It's not like that today. But right. it was different. And I always remember that because... You know, today, it's, it's, well, I'll share that later as well. Then, but my fond memories was this. When my mother was sick, they came to the house. Mm -hmm. They cleaned the house. Wow. They brought food in. Mm -mm. They it, it, was a, it was a tremendous relationship in that neighborhood. I even went to their houses. I slept in some of their beds. Wow. And uh, so at that time, we didn't know all of this situation that's going on now, which I'll elaborate on later. Okay. But my mama's memories was that. And even okay. going to school, we didn't have a car. We walked in the snow, the rain, and everything. But yet, people that they'd come along, they'd see us, they'd pick us up, give us a ride to the school. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it just that they looked out for each other. Okay. And even I started working at an early age, and and uh, I we got plenty of help from our surroundings. Oh, good. I, I'm sure that uh, we would have never been able to make it on our own. Okay. And so that was one of my fondest memories. The other was this, and I was young, but I still can remember when my dad passed, and the number of people that came through the house. Right. How old were you when your father died? Nine years old. Okay. I lost my father at eight and a half, so I can identify. So you can identify, for, can't you, Dr. Gilton? Oh, yeah, yes. definitely. And uh, just, it sticks in my memory how they kept checking to see if we needed anything. Right. Uh, and uh, it was just tremendous. It didn't take away the sting of losing my dad, but no. it gave us an uplift that somebody cared besides us. Okay. And, uh, and another thing that makes fond memories is that my mother worked hard. She worked hard. And uh, well, you could go to the grocery store. There's a store called Negrelli's in Peacetale. Okay. And Jake Negrelli run that. And uh, we would, mom would give us a note. We'd go down there and she could charge the food. You know, okay. you, get, you get your meat, your bread, your love. And she would pay him. We'd go to Friday, we'd go right down there and pay him. And if she didn't have it all, he says, don't worry about it, Rachel, because okay. I know you're going to pay me. If you need stuff, you don't have the money, send them down. You got it. That always stuck with me. And I said, wow. And uh, so we had a rough time, but yet God intervened. Okay. And uh, I was just pleased to be in the neighborhood that I was to grow up in. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was my fondest memories about that. Oh, that's great. That's great. Do you mind saying, like, what streets, you know, what area? Okay. North Road, Peacedale. Oh, okay. You know, you go right up past the, uh, well, you know where it is. You come, right. if you came Kersey Road, to mm -hmm. then you took a left, that's North Road, it comes out to Saga Tucket. Okay. Uh, halfway up. Is where we lived. Okay. And uh, oh, there's another story behind that that goes. We were we didn't have money them days, and uh, even I must say we didn't. We had a well. We didn't have running water at that time. Okay. But Roland Fiore's dad. Mm hmm Roland Senior. Okay. Man, he came and he said uh, to my mother, and I'm, "I'd like to do something for you. What can I do?" She said, "Well, I really need." some uh, remodeling of this house and stuff, but I don't have them. So I'll tell you what you do. You see that hill you got in the back there? It was a steep hill. We used to go down and slide on it and stuff. He bought that for way more than what it was worth. 
Wow. It was enough to remodel our house to a modern house. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I never did forget that. But before we moved there, that was my grandmother and grandfather's house. Okay. And we lived up on, let me see, what's the name of that road? We was up on Tower Hill. Mm -hmm. and, and you know right where, uh, well, where the old, where, where Massey's Oldsmobile place is. Okay. You, you go by that way, heading toward Providence, you'll see a, a long road that goes down in the woods. Okay. And we lived in a farmhouse down there. Wow. And that, my, that's where we were living when my dad passed. Okay. And he had cattle and we had horses, and but he was doing that for another person, plus he had a job. Right. And uh, so at, that's why we come to go to North Road after okay. my grandmother took us in. Okay. And then she, grandpa and grandma passed, and my mother got the house. Okay. And, uh, so that's where we lived. And But years ago, when my dad was living, I'm, I'm trying to reflect here now, uh, we lived right, on, right near URI. You know where 100 Acre Pond is? I, I think so. You know, if you if you're coming in for, off of 108 and you're coming into the university the back way, okay, you can see the field, football field, and all that. Well, Hundred okay. Acre Pond is right to the left. Used to be the turf farm for the URI. Right. On the, okay. Now you turn right to go down toward the gym. Mm -hmm. there, there used to be a field there, and we had a house right off that field. There wow. used to be. There was a stone, well, the stone building is still there, I think, on Plains Road. Okay. And, uh, used to be Ward's Potato Shed. Mm -mm. And my dad drove truck for Ward to Maine okay. potatoes. And I was a little boy, and I used to pick up the second potatoes there. Okay. So we lived there for about, oh, God, quite a while. These are ones I can remember now. Then the, the other one I can remember is down on 138, where you're going into... Uh, the Johnny Cake Meal place. Mm -hmm. All right. Before you wouldn't go down that road, but just before you get there, there was another field out there. And uh, okay. that was another farmhouse. We lived there too. For wow. quite a while. Okay. So, so we lived in several places, but the mainstay was North Road. Right. And okay. we lived off of Laurel Lane two years ago. Okay. And the golf course is now. Okay. So that's. The part of where we lived. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, okay. Some of your less pleasant memories of growing up in South County. Well, let me see some of my less memories. Let me see here now. What would it be? Uh, I would say mainly people trying to discourage you from what you'd want to do. Okay. Let me explain what I mean by that. And that was mainly my own race doing that. For mm. instance, when my first job after learning the mason trade was I went to Narragansett Electric and they tried to discard me. They said, the white man's not going to want you there. So I don't know why you're going to waste your time and go over there. Well, that was hurtful because I made up my mind what I told. I don't know did I say what my mother taught us. Number one, know who you are Mm -hmm. What you are. Number two, know what you want. The sky's the limit. And don't let your race get in your way. Right. So then I got discouraged from my own. And then there was some of the whites said the same thing. They don't have any blacks in the, on that at that time for Narragansett Electric. In this, I think there was only one hired in Providence at the time. Right. So I was determined I was going to make it. Okay. So I, I fill out the form. And I went and said, I don't worry about you, you'll never get it. I said, well, that's what you think. So I met, and I forget his name. His name was Mr. Dumlow. He was in, and at that time, Narragansett Electric in this area was all Italians working. Mm -hmm. And so I had an interview with him. And then uh, he said, I don't promise anything. But he said, when we gave you the test, you, you were tops in it. He said, but mm -hmm. I have somebody higher than me that will you say yes or no. So I, I come home with the idea that maybe not. You know, I was a little skeptic. I remember coming home from work. My wife said, Narragansett Electric called you. They need to hear from you. Said, you got the job. Oh, good. 
So I, I did things right. I gave my job two weeks notice because I was going. Ended being there 20 years. Wonderful. Retired from there early in the ministry. But, okay. But the discouragement was trying to say I couldn't make it. Right. Because right. of my race. And right. even we had exams to get promoted in Narragansett Electric. And some of my own colleagues said, yeah, you'll never make it. They're not going give, to get you over this person. But I got it. See, persistence. You never know until you try. Thank you, Dr. Gilton. And, but if you listen to people, mm -hmm. they'll discourage you before you even get started. Right, right. But at the time that happened, my mother came to my mind. Mm -hmm. Know who you are, Junior. Go after it. All you right. can do is fail. But right. at least you got to try. So, and then there was, there was times when, you know, we couldn't uh, do certain things that other people did. We got to admit it back there. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to be 10 steps ahead of them in order to get where you wanted to go. But what that meant, it taught me to be do hard work, study hard, mm -hmm. and prayer, prayer. And uh, there's nothing we can't do. Right and, on. And so I, I get kind of upset now when I see all these people on all these handouts and all this stuff. And it's it's not right. We have to go through something in this life. True, our race had to go through some very difficult times. It's but you had true. to be strong. Okay. I, I think you, Dr. Gilton, what an example. I mean, I'm sure you didn't have it easy either. But right. you were determined to get what you wanted. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And it pays off. Definitely. So, uh, it's been, it's been, life has been a challenge. But it's been a great challenge. Oh, good, good. You know, and, yeah. Yeah. Then I remember the another time was back when I was buying my first house, mm -hmm. which was years ago. Uh, what was it, 60, 64, I believe. Don't hold me to that, but I believe in 1964. And Reverend Kenneth Mars built my house. It was a yes. brand new one. And I remember going to the bank. And uh, so they said, well, Wallace, what, what, uh, how are you going to pay for this? So I said, just like everybody else. <laughs> I said, I'll pay my mortgage, whatever it is. If I can't afford it, I won't buy it. And uh, But it was just that little needle, you know. Right. But then the Lord worked it out that the next fellow that interviewed me at the bank, I knew him very well. Mm -hmm. He hardly asked me nothing. He said, you got the mortgage. All right. No, I got discouraged by the first guy. Right, they, right. I could have gone out there with my head down. Right. But. So there's circumstances like that when I had to fight for what I would like to get. But, well, others probably wouldn't have had to. Right. That was right. some disappointments, too. Yeah, yeah. Yes. One, one thing I'm wondering, uh, when, you, when, when you went to school, like high school, you know, what were your school days like? Yeah, my, up? my high school days was not bad. They Good, weren't bad. Okay. You know, uh, I, w I will say this, that uh, I didn't have to go through some things the other black people did. Okay. Because uh, it, it was tough for some of them, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you got to be positive. I would have had a rougher time if I wasn't focused. Right. Like, for instance, when it comes to sports, mm -hmm. you had to be better than the next person. Right. Otherwise, you didn't get the start on the basketball team or the mm -hmm. football team. I can remember the coach saying one day, said the biggest mistake I made, and he, he confessed it to everybody. When he cut one good athlete, his name was Joe Harris, was one of the best in all three sports, said that that's the worst thing I ever did. See, but Joe didn't get disgusted. He was mm -hmm. second team. He was first team, made all state. He had his mind, went on to college, and but there was little things like that. And you had right. to admit it, if you had, a, 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 say, a wealthy family in town, their son was playing ball, <laughs> you could have been way better than he was, but mm -hmm. you sit on the bench because of his parents. Mm -hmm. But sooner or later, they had to realize they couldn't win without us. Mm -hmm. And they said, but why didn't they use it in the first place? Right, he right. Said, Those are some of the things. And uh, 
But other than that, my high school days was good. I I had good teachers, good. and uh, and I had well, I had one that was wasn't that great. But you know, you get those. You so, do. But, but she wasn't going to defeat me. <laughs> right. I said, when it you, come to finals, I'm going to pass it no matter what. Right. And I you had that determination. Yeah, but if I didn't, if I was weak, I'd have flunked it. Mm -hmm. So there was times when they would discourage you. Right. But not right. all of them. See, not right. all of them. Right. And I had the privilege of the same one that wanted to uh, sort of discourage me. I funeralized her. Uh-oh. I was shocked when, wow. uh, when the family caught what well, was Story called me from the funeral home. He says, I have one for you. And he named the pet. I said, wait a minute. That was my school teacher. Yes, I know. Because her brothers and stuff are right here. But she put in, she wanted you to do her funeral. Isn't that something? Yeah. I, I would never Dr. to kill and dream that in my whole life. So that was quite an honor to be able to do that. Wow. That's something. Yeah. That's something. Wow. Then, then the other thing wasn't school, but I meant to mention this. My but my first boss at Narragansett Electric, he was Italian, and he was the foreman over all of us. Mm -hmm. And he was upset because he wanted to get his nephew in, and they hired me. So uh -oh. I can remember mm -hmm. I go on a second class. That's the next one is the top one, which is first class. Right. Tell me right out. I'll never pass you for first class. Well, what was I going to do? I did my job. He was on vacation. Now that I look back, it was God working for me. The dental foreman came, and I was down the Boone Street. I'll never forget it. Now, a second class shouldn't be working up on all the high primaries by themselves. Right. That's me. I was up there by myself. Mm -mm. And he drove up, and he said to the, is that Wallace up there? Isn't he second class? Said, yeah. He said, but he, the guy was with my partner said, but he's good. He can do it all. He said, okay. Uh huh. So he asked me to come down. Right. He said, he said, I was watching you for a half hour. You didn't even know it. When are you supposed to make first class? I said, next month. But my boss said, I'll never make it. He said, I got news for you. You're first class right now. Right on. I'm all the right. one to make that decision. Yes. So when my boss came back that I was working for, we're on South County Trail. I never will forget it. When you're second class, you have to climb every other pole. When, mm -hmm. you're, when you're first class, you do the third pole. Ah. So he came up, he says, uh, go ahead up there, he said. I said, I'm not climbing that. He said, you're not. I said, no, I'm not going to climb it. Well, he said, that's insubordination. I said, I know. So he said, do you hear this? To the guy? But the guys already knew I was first class. Mm -hmm. So he called the general foreman. And he said, come on, Wallace, get in the car. I did. He said, uh, this is an example, he said to the general foreman, why he's not going to make first class. He refused to climb the pole he's supposed to. So the big boss said, he doesn't have to. He's first class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, who made him first class? I did. Do you uh -oh. know anymore? I saw him up in a rat. They call it a rat. He handled that job as good as anybody. So right. he paid last week with first class pay. He Beautiful. was ripping. But then things reversed. I was passing New Haven. I came back. I had to visit somebody at the hospital. And I heard this weak voice. Reverend. I said, who is that? I went back. It was him. And mm -hmm. he was dying. Wow. He said, I'm glad. I want you to forgive me, he said. Wow. I was rotten. And I prayed, I prayed for him right there. Wow, that's so, heavy duty. The Lord fights your battle. Yes, he does. And uh, But it wasn't easy, Dr. Gim. I don't no. know why. Sometimes I felt like grabbing him, you know. Wow. But, but wow. you can't do that. Well, yeah, you have to be five steps ahead of them. All the time. And think, you know all about it. So right. them some of my memories. All some right. Good, some weren't so good. But. Right, right. Okay. Uh, uh, what <laughs> individuals had the most impact on you as you grew up and in what respects? Okay. There were two men 
in my life that was great mentors. One was Reginald Hazard Sr. He's my okay. called okay. me. He called me his son. Right. The other one was the Reverend Kenneth Mars. Okay. They were tremendous mentors to me in okay. this town, but I had mentors other places too. Right. But they were great influence. They were father images. Yeah. Where I didn't have a dad. Okay. See. I could okay. go to them with anything. Mm-hmm. And they would be straight up with me. If right. I had to straighten up on something, they'd tell me. If I was doing good, they'd tell me that. And uh, so they, they were great help to me. And then there were some business people in this town that was great help to me mm-hmm. and inspiration. I could go and talk to them about anything, and they wouldn't leave me wrong. And one, like I told you, was Roland Fiore Sr., Yes. Okay. And then it was uh, Joe Costanza. He owned the meat market on uh, high, on High Street years ago. Okay. It's still, I think his son still cuts meat there. I'm not sure. But he used to call it Jelly Bean. <laughs> okay. And he was a great influence. I would sit there and talk to him for hours. And he would give me good advice. Wow. He would say, I came up the rough side. Mm-hmm. He's Italian. And he said, if I listened to people, I wouldn't have had nothing. Yeah. And I started from the bottom. He said, you see me now, I have this meat market and et cetera. He said, but I didn't always have that. He said, I worked in the laundry at South County Hospital. I didn't have wow. that. He said, but it got me started. Mm-hmm. And then I went on to do this. He said, I'm telling you my story so it might help you down right. the road. I kept all that stuff in my mind, you know. Mm-hmm. I said, well, some of these people never had, weren't rich and had it like they got now, but they worked for what they wanted. Wow. And they learned how to save a penny. There was another one named Mr. Diorio on North Road where we grew up. And I remember I used to mow his lawn. Okay. And he used to give me $5, but that was a lot of money then. It was. And then, and then he gave me $10. I said, I want, to give you, I want you to give your mother $5 of this. He said, and then with what you got, I want you to spend this and, and put the rest in the bank. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the mowing season, all this stuff I thank God for. He said, I want to see how much of money you saved. That's how he talked. And I was proud of him, a little old bank book. He said, you're a good boy. He said, so, so he, this is what I'm going to do. Now, back there, Dr. Gillen, this is worth a lot. He gave me $50. Woo! And he said, that's because you're a good boy. Wow. You, my lawn. you take care of your mother. See, so these weren't educated people, Mm-mm. but they were people that made good. And I always had that philosophy, pick somebody else's brain. Yes, yes. Yeah, what color they were. Yeah. Because I want to see how they got where they got. Mm-hmm. And how they did it. Because you can get the wrong concept. Oh, well, he's mafia. He robbed this one. I'm not talking about that stuff. Mm-mm. I'm talking about people that come up the rough side of the mountain. Right. Like right. They did. So they were some of the mentors in my life. And uh, then there were others in Boston and around that were, were very good to me as a young man. Oh, that's and, good. And, uh, so I had I had good mentors. Then later on, as I got in the ministry, I had even bigger mentors. Okay. Yeah. My last one passed away here three years ago at 92 years old. Wow. Yeah, Dr. James Earl Massey. Okay. Great theologian. So I had a lot of good people in my life. And I, I imagine uh, uh, Bishop Kenneth Moss was one of them too. Oh, yeah. I said him. Oh, 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 you missed it. I said that. Oh, no, right. I didn't say the ministry part. That's right. Right. No, nope, he was. He was He was really instrumental. I came, right. up, I came up under him. Okay? Yes. And then uh, I become his assistant okay. after I was ordained. And that was another story. He said, uh, you're ready to be ordained. You've got your courses done. You got... But there was a couple of, I just won't say it, a couple of white ministers on that credential committee didn't want me to make it. Right. And he said, you're going to make it. He said, I can't be on it because you're, you're one of mine. I have to come off where they interview. 
you go right in there like you know what you're doing and you do know. So I passed it in flying colors. Good. That was another thing. And then uh, one of the greatest things that he did for me was he said, uh, you know, you, you've been under me long enough. Whenever God tells you, you can move because you're well capable of doing it. So I still stayed there, but I went to the War Church of God. And that was, it was in the 70, I think, around 70. And that was all white congregation. And uh, they, they, they were really thrilled to death. But then the problem come is when I was going to integrate to church. Mm-hmm. I bring in the blacks, some Chinese people. To, oh, we didn't want that. I said, well, then you don't want me. Yeah. So I'm not going to yeah. stay. I'm not going to stay in a condition like that. That's not in the Bible, I said. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a shame of my race. You're not a shame, but we can come together and make it work. And so after I left, they felt bad because their father died. I didn't hold grudge. I went back and I funeralized him. So that was one instant. Then I went from there to the Narragansett Indian tribe. I pastored them for about two years. Okay. Bought them as far as I could. Then they wanted to play games. So I don't have time for playing games here. Yeah. So, then I went back home, and I was on a revival circuit. I traveled all over. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'd come back off a revival, and the Lord said to me, I called you to be a pastor, not an evangelist. And it was just plain days if you were sitting inside of me. So I told my pastor about that. He said, I already knew it. I was just waiting for you to get the confirmation. Wow. So he brought me along in that area. And then New Haven, I didn't know the full story, but the pastor had been there for about 35 years, I think it was. And he left and went to Florida. And they didn't have any money, hardly at all. But I remember him calling me saying, can I speak to you and Diane today? I said, sure. But I know he said when he retired, you should be the man to get this. But I'm, I was very observant. I said, I don't take anything unless the Lord tells me to take it. Mm. And he respected me for that. So anyway, he said, I got a call from the church in New Haven. You've preached there before. I said, yeah, I have. He said, but that desperate need of a pastor and help. And they asked me, do I know anybody? I said, sure I do. He said, I got one right in my church can do it. I said, well, well you told him that? He said, yeah. Well, I said, you know how I am. I respect you, but... I got to pray on this. I don't know. He said, well, here's what you do. He said, would you be willing to go over the first Sunday with me? I said, yes. And I, so I agreed to take it for two months to help them. And so at the end of two months, they said, we'd like to vote you in this. I said, no, no, can't do that. I said, I got to pray about it. Let's, let's go. I will be here though to do the, the work because I have a full-time job. But I said, I got to pray. You pray. And make sure we're a good fit for each other. Because it could be I don't want it. could be you don't want me. Oh, we don't know. You don't know already. Mm Because you don't know me and I don't know you. So we got to grow together. So at the end of six months, I was installed as a senior pastor. 